practices in-house. Okay, so I'm just going to um, introduce the publishing model. Um, I'm sure you've, you're aware of it, but just to iron out any um, questions there might be with regards to how it, how it actually operates. Then I'm going to go through um, pre-publication checks. I'm going to go through open data a bit. Um, sorry, I haven't added it on the outline, but we're also going to address peer review more specifically this time as well. Um, and then we'll have a summary in time for any questions. Oh, sorry, just give me a second to move this. Okay, on this all the Okay, so to have a quick look at the publishing model, which um, is, like I said, slightly different to a more traditional model. Um, so we begin with article submission. Each paper upon submission is checked by our in-house team for suitability and eligibility for publication. Um, so this is looking at the article to ensure that it adheres to our specific guidelines at F1000 Research, but also that it adheres to the wider publishing standards um, in that area as well. So I'll go through those checks later on in the presentation in more detail. So once an article has been submitted, that when we see that it has passed all those um, initial checks and all our pre-publication checks in more detail, and it's, um, it's at a standard that can be published, we will then publish the article online um, and that can actually be published as quickly as two weeks. It depends on how quick and how, um, how busy we are at the time. It depends on a lot of different factors to do with the kind of how complex the article is, um, how busy production are, but it can be as quick as two weeks. So it goes from submission to publication at that point as well, any data that is associated with the article should also uh, be made available in an online repository um, and a DOI would be issued as well with the publication of the article. I will go into the specifics of that in more detail later on. This is also when the article is indexed with um, Google Scholar, for example, and at this point, as the article has a DOI, it is accessible and citable in its current form. Following that, the peer review takes place. So the article will be available online um, and then the peer review team will invite reviewers. The process is led by the authors. Um, so authors can propose reviewers or um, can seek reviewers that are suggested by our system, so our reviewer um, suggestion tool, which I'll go into more detail on later on as well. Um, so reviewers need to meet our criteria, but the authors are in control of that process um, as long as the reviewers fit our criteria, which I'll go into later. Um, we, we do look that there's um, no conflicts of interest with the reviewers, for example, um, and then we would invite suggested reviewers. Any reviewer reports we then receive are published alongside um, online alongside the article, so they can be read with the article um, on the same interface um, and the details of the reviewers are also given. So it's a completely open process. All reviews are checked um, in house by editorial team before publication, so we do have an element of control just in case of anything that um, goes against our standards. Uh, we ask reviewers to only focus on technical aspects and the soundness of the paper rather on any subjective assessment on whether the article is suitable to be published, given that the article has already been published. Um, so we have deemed it to be of a standard to be published. The reviewer's job is to actually comment on the content itself. So the reviewers will provide a written report as well as selecting one of three statuses. So they will could select that they approve the article, they approve the article with reservations, or they do not approve the article. Once the reviewers, the, sorry, the article has received the reviewers reports, and we require at least two reviewers reports to proceed, um, the authors can choose if they want to revise their paper in line with the re reviewer comments, and then any new versions will be published alongside, um, they'll be published and linked to the original submission, 
um, and the article, the new version will be sent back to reviewers if necessary for further comment. So the whole process is open um, and authors, readers, uh, reviewers can see everything that's happening at any stage. So the final step for an article to pass peer review and be sent to relevant indexes and repositories where a paper is where a paper either needs two approved statuses or one approved status and two approved with reservations. So at that point, once uh, any version of the article receives those statuses, then we can um, proceed with sending the article to relevant indexes and repositories. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the pre-publication, the specific pre-publication checks that we do. So for an article to be published, like I mentioned, it must undergo, um, it must pass our in-house editorial checks before it can go be published and go through peer review. Um, take you through those now. So this, these are the points that our editorial team are looking for to ensure that the article is eligible to be published. So first, the article must be original, the, it can't be plagiarised and it can't have high levels of overlap in the, in the text. So we have a programme that we can use to determine that. Um, so that is a point that we would look for to in, to ensure that we can publish. Any of these points you see in red will are points that if these are not met at that, when we first look through the article, um, we would reject or go back to the authors asking for more information. So these are kind of some preliminary checks that we do, which we call initial checks, before we go into a full, um, a full copy edit, as it were. So to ensure that your article is not desk rejected and to ensure that it moves on to the next stage, the red points are the kind of major overarching things we're looking for. Um, and if there's any issues with these that we consider to be um, a concern, we may reject completely at this stage. Um, one thing to remember when I'm talking about rejecting, depending on what the issue is, when we reject, we are saying we're rejecting at this point as it's not, the article isn't up to our standards for publication. However, if you address these points, we would welcome you to resubmit with these changes addressed. So it's not a hard reject that we won't consider your article that it's fl completely flawed. It's more a reject with the option of addressing the points and resubmitting. Um, so yeah, so like I said, must be original, not plagiarized and not large parts of overlap. Secondly, um, at least one author needs to be a qualified researcher or scholar um, and adhere to our criteria there. So with our author criteria, what we're looking for is at least one author to have a PhD qualification or, um, or equivalent or dependent on subject area. So if um, the subject area is more humanities or social sciences uh, rather than um, life sciences, for example, um, we would look that an author has a relevant master's qualification and a good publication record. Um, so I can give you some links later for more information on authorship criteria if you have queries regarding that. Thirdly, articles must be written in clear English. Um, so this means that um, the English has to be legible and that any errors in grammar, syntax, uh, vocabulary, doesn't impact the understanding of the article. Um, so we don't provide an in-depth language copy edit. We're, uh, we are actually checking that the, um, the article flows well. The English is good enough that the argument can be clearly understood. And it's, so any issues with language don't impede understanding. If they do, um, if the level of language actually stops us being able to edit to a good standard, then we would reject and ask for the authors to get a professional uh, copy edit or at least a copy edit by a subject um, 
somebody with knowledge of the subject of the article and who is a native English language speaker. Um, then the next point is that the article meets research and publication standards, and this includes any ethical guidelines. So, for example, if the article deals with um, animals or humans, there's certain ethical guidelines that uh, must be adhered to. Um, we can go into this in more detail later on. So I haven't highlighted this in red as it this um, this is something where if there are any issues, we can actually address these later on at our full pre-publication checks. However, for example, if it were an article which we're dealing with human participants and no consent had been um, gained for, had been obtained, sorry, for conducting the experiment, that would be a major concern and flaw in the research. So we would actually reject on that. But for anything where it just needs some further clarity, um, we might address that later on. Okay, so uh, further editorial requirements, we would be looking that the uh, study adheres to appropriate reporting guidelines. I will give you some more information on reporting guidelines later on, um, but these are just kind of specific industry standard guidelines which help with, um, with, <laughs> with writing. Um, with writing the articles in line with these guidelines depending on the subject area. So it's helpful for authors so that they know that they've included all the requirements for this type of study. So we've got here, it would be consort, for example, if you are right, your article refers to a clinical trial or strobe guidelines for observational studies. So when we're editing, we actually use these checklists that are, you can obtain online and we ensure that each point of the checklist has been addressed in the article. Um, like I say, I'll go into this in further detail a bit later on. And then another major point, um, so this is one of the first points we look for in our initial checks, is that uh, the study has received appropriate ethical approval and consent from participants. This is what I just mentioned before. And a statement must be included in the article to this effect. So again, I will go into this in more detail later on. But as I said, if the article has involves human participants and there isn't a statement saying we obtained um, informed consent from the participants, we would actually reject. So you may have the um, the consent may have been obtained, but you have, for example, forgotten to include the statement or the statement is elsewhere. Um, in this case, we would reject, but then you could come back to us and resubmit and say, this is where the, this is the statement, I've now included it and we can continue with the process. But it's very important to have that clear statement there. And that's to adhere to our in-house guidelines, but also um, wider publishing industry standards. And then all underlying methodolog methodological details and relevant data must be included. So with this, with the methods, this is why it's helpful to use reporting guidelines and checklists for that to ensure that all points are being met. Um, so this is why we encourage this. We, in terms of data, it is integral that a data availability statement is included in the submitted article. So that's one point where we would also reject, do a desk reject if there's no information regarding the data that is associated with the article. Again, I'll go into further detail on what is actually required with that later on. And then the authors must also agree to pay any article processing charges which are applicable to the submission. OK, so like I said, um, with reporting guidelines, some types of study require particular reporting guidelines. So this is a way to structure your article and conduct your study according to a standardized format for the publishing industry. So you can see some examples here of study types which, um, which must adhere to reporting guidelines. Oh, sorry. Give me a second. Yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, so you've got some examples here of um, study types that must adhere to these reporting guidelines. I've included um, links out to these so I can circulate the presentation following, um, following our meeting today so you can have a look at those. These are the ones that I think will be most um, applicable for articles pertaining to social science, business and management, which is what I was asked to 
to um, specify this presentation to today. So they're included there. The, if you go on the link at the bottom for the Equator Network, there'll be wider um, available checklists for different study types. Um, if you have any questions about any other study types, I can try and answer. Um, as I said, I'm, I spe um, specialize in humanities and social sciences. So if it's kind of more science, harder science based, I might have to go back to my colleagues for some more information. But these are the checklists that you can use for these different studies. Okay. So, in terms of ethical approval, which I mentioned earlier as well, we any study that had human or animal subjects uh, must have a clear ethical approval statement. As I said, this might apply more if you are conducting more of a uh, life sciences um, article, um, but I'm just going to give the information as it can come into kind of uh, more qualitative um, social science articles where you might be um, involving human participants by conducting a questionnaire or survey, for example, it also applies. So like I say, with human subjects, that could be um, like drug experimentation, but it could, could also be interviews, online surveys. So that's something to, to bear in mind when you're looking at whether your article requires an ethical approval and an ethics statement. So for ethical approval, this must come from an institutional review board or an other appropriate body. So we would require that to be included in the ethical um, considerations statement. If your study does not involve um, any human or animal participants, you don't need to include a statement to that effect. It's only if you are um, if it does include animals or humans in some way. So you've got an example you can see here at the bottom of an, of an um, ethical consideration statement. So here you have the, um, the university is the institution, so the Institutional Re Review Board. You also have um, a protocol number for this particular for this particular study. Here is where if you had an approval number, we would want that included as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is kind of the standard that you would have for ethical approval. I don't know if, sorry, I don't know if I've included consent. Yeah. So if we go on to consent here um, involving humans, um, you can see that there's two kind of cons two kinds of consent that may need to be obtained if you are doing an experiment, doing an article which includes human participants. So firstly, we look at consent to participate. So this is for all studies involving humans, written informed consent to take part in the research must have been obtained from the participants. So it's very important, this statement here, written informed consent. So this is actually the wording that we're looking for when you're including this statement. So we need to know that it was, um, it was written and that the participants actually knew what was involved in the study when they gave their consent to participate. If it was verbal consent, you need to provide some more information as to why it was verbal consent. So if written consent couldn't be given for any reason, so you, you need to kind of justify why, why it wasn't written. So we wouldn't necessarily reject, but it has to be an adequate reason. And then secondly, we're looking at consent to publish, uh, looking for consent to publish identifiable data. So we ask that all data that is um, included in the article and uploaded to an online repository is made anonymous as much as is possible. If any of that data cannot be anonymized and is identifiable, it identifies the participants. Um, the participant must have signed consent for you to publish that data and that information. So firstly, is just consent for participation. If there is identifiable data, we need consent for publication of the, of the article and of the data. So um, what we ask for is this consent statement, as you can see the examples at the bottom there, 
we don't actually ask you um, for every article to give us the evidence of that consent, but you have to have obtained it as in some circumstances we might request it. Um, and this might actually be following publication as well, if there's any issues that might arise or anything like that. So ensure that you've obtained it and keep it on record in case we need to ask for it at any stage. Um, also bear in mind if participants in your study are minors, so if there's children involved um, or anybody who cannot actually give their consent for any reason, they might have reduced mental capacity, for example, you must obtain written informed consent from a parent or legal guardian, and that must be made clear in that um, consent statement as well. Okay, so just give a roundup. Sorry, I thought someone had a question. Just to give a summary of the ethical approval and consent. If your study involves human participants, you must include details of the ethical committee approval, including institution, review board name, and permit numbers or approval numbers. A statement confirming that participants gave written informed consent to participate in the study, and if applicable, written informed consent for you to publish their identifiable data. If your study involved animals, you must include in your article the details of the ethical committee approval, including the institution review board name and permit numbers. Okay, moving on to open data now, which I think was um, where a lot of the questions stemmed from for this, um, for us to put on this webinar today. Um, with open data, we have quite rigorous open data policies, so we cannot publish any articles that do not contain clear data availability statements. Um, I mentioned this in that this comes up in our initial checks to make sure that we can move on with an article, put it through the pre-publication checks and publication. So I'm going to give you more information now on actually what we mean by open data, what our requirements are, and give you some examples of um, data availability statements so that you've got an idea of the different ways that these can look um, depending on the nature of your study, the nature of the article um, and what the data actually is. So when we're talking about data, it can take many different forms, especially if we're thinking about humanities um, and social sciences, it might not be um, necessarily obvious what the data is, but the data can be qualitative or quantitative. So if you were conducting a survey, the, um, the answers to that survey, if they are just kind of written speech, if they're opinions, that counts as the qualitative data, or obviously quantitative is more um, like numerical data that you might obtain, which might be a bit more obvious. So it can also be factual, so measured or non-factual, perceived, and also, as I said, numerical, textual or audiovisual. So anything um, that um, that is created from, from your study, that the output of the study will consider as the data. So to give you some examples here, we data could include field notes, case study notes, observations, um, audio and video interviews or focus groups, surveys and questionnaires, as I mentioned. Um, Western blot gels, if you're doing more um, scientific studies, <laughs> software code and genome sequences. So this is just some examples. Obviously, it's mu much more vast what the data could um, comprise. So looking at our data policies, the idea behind our data policies are that they are as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So um, data needs to be provided in a non-proprietary format with adequate metadata. So data should not be behind a paywall. So it shouldn't be put in a repository where somebody to access it needs to create an account with that repository, which they need to pay for, for example. Um, and there shouldn't be any restrictions to access where possible. The data should be hosted in a trusted repository with a persistent identifier. Um, you can find a list of um, approved repositories on our data guidelines page, which I've linked out to here. Um, 
sorry, go back. You can also, um, there are also other repositories outside of this list, um, which you can use if it's kind of an approved institution repository, for example. So if the repository you want to use is not on the list um, and you're not sure about whether we would accept it or not, I would actually advise emailing um, us first um, before submitting to check if, if we will accept that repository and that will streamline the process for you more later on. So we ask that data is published under a um, CC0 license where it's safe and legal to do so. So this is um, um, to ensure the openness of the data. Again, I've included a link here out to the license for you to get more information, <coughs> sorry, on what that actually, um, how that influences your data and how it is available to the wider public. Um, as I said, the article must include a data availability statement. This must be included whether there is data associated or not. And I'll give you examples of what you would do depending on what data you have and if data is actually included at all. An article should provide links between articles and data sets. So we ask that data um, adheres to the FAIR data principles, and this is that it is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And again, this is just for background context, so I didn't want to delve too much into these points, um, as I think from I got that you want to concentrate more on kind of the practical, what you need to do, um, so the steps for publication. But if you do want some more context or information on that, there's a link out there as well to the FAIR data principles. And again, I've included a link here to our data guidelines, which are really comprehensive on the website. So any um, any information you need on data can be accessed there. So it's good to always refer to that when you're thinking about submitting data. So I'm just going to take a mute so I can cough a second. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, and this is just a screenshot to show you where the data guidelines are. So I've included the link, but this is where you can find it on the website under the how to publish menu. And then this is um, the links out to the different repositories for general data um, research materials and supporting documents. Um, but like I said, any that aren't on here, I would check with our editorial team before submitting um, to see if it's one that we can accept. Okay, so finally, um, in terms of data, I want to go through some different data availability statements. Um, what, what I've done is provided different um, scenarios for each article. Um, I've included a link out to the article so you can actually look more in depth at what the article, um, what is involved, what the subject area is, where you can see the data. I'm not going to go out to those on this call today because I think it's actually more useful for you to take your time to have a look through those um, if you need to use it to model your own data availability statements. But if you have any questions, uh, remember to raise your hand during this or you can also email me after to ask if it's not clear but I just want you to look here really at the templates um, that I've given you for the different for the different data availability statements um, so this first one is a literature review so they firstly got the underlying data so this has been uploaded you can see there on um, Figshare so you need to include the repository name then the title, then you would include the, um, the link to the, and the DOI and the author's uh, names and the, and the date for the, um, for the data uh, being deposited as well. Then you would need to list exactly what is included in that underlying data on the repository. Um, so, this is the kind of the standard that we would want the data availability statement to take. So you have first the information on the repository title DOI. Next, you would have um, a, a note saying this project contains the following underlying data. Underneath that, you would list every data file that there is and also provide a title, 
of each data file there or make it clear what it actually includes so that um, somebody can and a reader can have a look and know what they're going to be able to access when they go to that link on the repository. Then um, we also would ask for any extended data. So when we talk about extended data, this might be what you might traditionally consider to be supplementary information. So many traditional kind of journals uh, article model is that you can include supplementary information at the end of an article and this would kind of link out as a as a separate file. So we call this extended data. So anything that's not the um, kind of raw underlying data, the output of your research, um, we would consider this supplementary or extended data, which also needs to be uploaded to the repository. So again, the same information is required. You need to say um, where the, what the repository is, clear title, and then DOI authors' names what is included in that underlying data. So here we would have data file A, which is a list of finance companies and then data file B. Um, so the key here is that it is, is clarity really. Everything it needs to be clear what each file um, contains and what information is the readers can obtain from going to your data. Finally, you need to include the license that the data is held under. Like I said, we encourage um, the Creative Commons Zero, no rights reserved data waiver in all cases where possible. If it's not under this, then we would need to look um, into that further to see why it can't be held under, under this license. Um, but again, I would ask any questions you might have about that as and when they arise so we can let you know what is um what we can consider also you need to actually include a hyperlink here on the license so it links out to the license itself okay another example is a um a questionnaire so a qualitative study that authors um conducted here i just wanted to show you that the questionnaire um and uh, the associated data with that <laughs> is considered to be extended data. And again, it's very similar um, to before. Sorry, something I forgot to mention um, as well. No, I did. You have to include the, um, when you include the DOI, you also have to reference the data. Um, so any data that you're using and that you include in your data availability statement, please include a reference to that data, include the data in the reference list at the end of your article. So reference it like you would any data you were using. And you also need to refer to any data in the article itself. Um, yeah, so again, standard kind of um, statement here. Again, look at these in your own time. And I would encourage you to actually get in touch with me um, if you have any more specific questions on each of these. Okay, and then I want to look at um, a data availability statement, which actually has some restrictions due to social media. So we do have a policy around social media and what can be shared, which you can find in our article um, guidelines of publishing policies. So with this one, the authors have actually stated that due to ethical and copyright limitations around the social media data, the underlying data cannot be disclosed. So what we ask if the data cannot be disclosed, you need to make it clear why it cannot be disclosed. And here they've actually provided um, more of a description of what the data set is because it, they cannot actually include it in the repository. So we need as much clarity and information as possible for the data, especially if there's restrictions and why those restrictions are there. Um, here as well, the authors actually have um, software availability statement as well as they have, um, they've suggested an algorithm and a model for counting and estimating crowd density. So that's part of the nature of their study. So as they're actually um, creating their own model, suggesting their own algorithm, we ask that that's included as software. It's clear where that software can be found. Um, and again, given the license um, for the software here as well. Um, any questions around software availability, I'd encourage you to get in touch with me again. Um, I haven't gone into too much detail 
um, as it's something that doesn't always um, arise. So if you do have any questions, please get in contact. I can always give more detailed information on that if necessary later on as well. And then we have a humanities article here, which does not use a repository. So um, what they've said in their data availability statement is they've given clear information of where they got their data from. So the collection used for this paper is here and it's held by the University of Glasgow Archives and Special Collections. Then they've given a clear link to where you can access that data from. They then have told you what the restrictions might be on accessing the data and how you can um, gain access. So here you can see they've given a clear email address for you to gain access to that. So if it's not your data, but it um, it would still need to be accessible in some way, but you need to give clear instructions on how to get access to it. Too. So um, a link to where to get access and also how. So this, is, this example here is a form of restricted data. Again, this is more due to um, intellectual sensitivity of the, of the data. So they've said that due to commercial and intellectual sensitivity of the data handled in the study, the interviews, transcripts and memos have been stored um, at the a data repository at Northumbria University. Um, and this is uh, because it's required by the EU Commission. So again, cannot share the data openly, but if you do have any um, queries on the data or want to request access, this is the person you need to contact and here is their clear contact details. So again, any restrictions, as much information as possible on why it is restricted and how to gain access um, and who is eligible to gain access as well is, is really important. Okay, finally, I've given you some more kind of simplified um, data availability statements. So um, this article here is a humanities article where any data has actually been included in the article itself as it's it might be um, included in the table, for example, it's not extensive, so it can be included in one table, one or two tables in the article um, and has been discussed in the article itself. Um, so no additional source data are, are required to be uploaded to a repository or to be linked out to. This is the standard statement we would ask you to include if this is the um, if this is the situation with your own article. So all data underlying the results are available as part of the article and no additional source data are required. This might also apply if you were um, if you were doing a study which looked into more of a humanity study, for example, where you were discussing um, quotes from a text and all the information or the quotes were actually included in your article itself. This is the kind of situation as well where this would be applicable. Finally, if there is no data associated with your article at all, you don't discuss any data, you don't output any data, the standard um, data availability statement we would need you to include is to say that no data are associated with this article. So it's quite simple. OK, just to give a summary then um, of the editorial requirements um, that we need for your article to pass our initial checks and not be desk rejected is again original, not plagiarized, no textual, no large parts of textual overlap. Um, which aren't referenced. At least one author is a um, qualified researcher and scholar and adheres to our authorship criteria. The English is clear and legible. It has the appropriate ethical approval and consent from participants and a, a statement must be included to this effect in the article. It must adhere to any appropriate reporting guidelines um, dependent on the study. And it includes all underlying methodological details and relevant data availability statements. Okay. So finally, I'm just gonna give a couple of slides regarding the open peer review process as this was also um, some lots of questions are also asked around this and how to select appropriate reviewers. Um, so looking at the peer review, review process, 
like I said, peer review begins after the article is published. The peer review reports are published alongside the article, so they can be easily read by um, anybody reading the article at the time. Articles only pass peer review when two approved reports are received or one approved and two approved with reservations are published. Authors are the ones who are responsible for suggesting suitable reviewers um, and they can use our um, reviewer suggestion tool if they don't have anybody who comes to mind um, at the start of the process. So looking into who we can actually consider to be a suitable reviewer for your paper, any reviewer suggested by the author should be an expert in the subject area of that article and they should have a publication record which we can access online which demonstrates this so they have a, a sufficient number of publications within that area um, and also kind of we would be looking how uh, recent they are as well for example they should generally hold a phd or a master's or equivalent um, depending on the subject area like i said um, more towards the humanities or social sciences side, we can consider a master's to be sufficient as long as we have um, the publication record to match that. So that's similar to when we're looking for authorship criteria for a paper. They must not have published with the authors themselves on the article. So the authors who all listed article, authors, sorry, on that submitted article, published article. The reviewer cannot have published with any of those authors in the last three years and must not currently be working on anything with the authors. Um, and they must not be from the same affiliation as any of the authors. When suggesting uh, reviewers as well, please bear in mind um, that we would need these um, to be global. Um, and so the suggestions should be from a variety of countries and preferably um, institutions as well to get we want to gain as rounded um, a, a review or as rounded reviews on the article as possible um, that is integral for kind of the integrity of the open peer review process for readers um, for the reviewers themselves but it's also more beneficial for for you as authors to have more rounded um, views on your paper okay so if you look at how to find the reviewers themselves. We recommend searching um, sites like Google Scholar, Scopus and PubMed uh, for similar articles that uh, have been published in a similar field to what you're publishing in. Um, the authors uh, may be suitable uh, to review as well, so looking at those authors of those similar articles um, in the different sites as well could be a way to go. The authors of the references cited in your article could be suitable. So the 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 sorry the literature that you've actually used to to write your study itself. Consider the reference list for that if there is anybody suitable from there. Um, you as an expert in your field of research may be aware of kind of prominent labs, for example, if it's more science based, um, whose staff may be suitable. So think about your own um, your own um, surroundings around your field as well. Um, as I said, we also provide a review of finder tool. Um, so this generates a list of academics who are potentially suitable and that will be shared um, when we're asking you to provide your reviewers as well. So there's a link out to that in our email correspondence to you. When you're suggesting reviewers, we have a specific uh, peer review team who actually do check every single reviewer suggestion. Um, so if, if you are not adhering to these guidelines when selecting your reviewers, you're selecting somebody who's unsuitable, that could actually cause delays in the publication and peer review process to your article. So it, it's important, just as important as making sure that you're adhering to our guidelines for publication, um, that you're adhering to our guidelines for reviewers as well, to make sure that you have as smooth a smoother publishing experience as possible with us. Okay, so that is all um, the slides I had. Um, I know it was a lot of information to take in. Um, I tried to make it as succinct as possible to the specific questions as well um, that arose. But if anything wasn't clear, you want me to go back over anything or you have any questions that have arisen from that, please do um, feel free to 